Hey guys, it's Savvy Savs, and I have a special guest with me today. His name is Joel Richards. He's a Boston public school teacher, and he's running for Boston City Council for District 4. Hi, Joel. How you doing? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks so much for coming. So before we get into uh, your political issues, could you tell everyone a little bit about your background? Man, well, I am Joel Richards, and I want to be Boston City for uh, District Four City Councilor, right? Um, I'm a first generation American. I'm a proud product of two Jamaican proud parents. Um, I went to Morehouse College. I'm a Boston public school teacher. Uh, I've been doing. I've been teaching for the last 14 years. Eight of that in Boston public schools. Um, and about me personally. Um, I'm a father of two children. I've been married for seven years. Um, I live in Fields Corner. My wife and I were blessed enough to buy a house about five years ago now. And um, not only that, I have a ministry where I go around the city and in Massachusetts and I give pastors rest. So I show up to their church and I, I say like, you take a Sunday off, come to church with your parishioners. And I get to unpack scripture with different communities all over Massachusetts, hopefully one day of the world. Um, I'm also the chair of Black Lives Matter at school, where we advocate for more counselors in the school, less cops, um, the hiring of black teachers, right? The end of zero tolerance and ethnic studies woven into every part of history and social studies taught in school. So yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell, yeah. Awesome, so Joel, why did you decide to run for city council? Man, that's, I love that question. Every time I get it, right? Uh, it goes to the heart of the campaign. My, uh, my big three, right? Um, I call it big three because everyone remembers when um, um, Kevin Garnett and Ray Allen came to town and joined up with Paul Pierce and brought home that championship, right? So I call it my big three to bring home like a, a positive reinforcement as a teacher. Um, give me that one for free. Try to positive reinforcement <laughs> with, your, uh, with your points, right? So, you know, it's housing. Um, education and small business. Uh, housing is personal to me. My wife and I struggled through the housing process, ran into racism at several banks. Mm -hmm. um, my wife has, herself has been homeless in her, in her early 20s. Um, so I have to ask the question, how in a city as affluent as Boston do we have a housing crisis, right? How, right? How is that even possible, right? But I know, I know in my heart um, that the city of Boston has the ability um, to provide affordable housing, not just for rent, but also for purchase, right? So when you think about housing, that affects me there. Well, I know we'll go more into the issues, but just giving you like the heart of my campaign. Secondly, education. As a, as a Boston public school teacher, I see the disparity every day, right? There are schools that always have the right amount of resources, always have um, the right teacher to staff, rate, teacher to student ratio, right? Always have the, uh, the technology and the resources they need, but other schools do not. All right. And then when it comes to small business, as an as a person who is a first generation American, I know the importance and the risk and what it takes for an immigrant family or a working class family to take that step to start a small business in, in their neighborhood. Right. That's reinvestment back into their neighborhood. That's why I've also been the chair of Fields Corner Main Street. Right. I've been involved with Main Street for the last five or six years, just working to support that type of community reinvestment. Right. Um, and so that's like the heart of my campaign and the heart of why I'm running, because those are the three big issues that I see really affecting people that look like me and the students that I serve, the people stuck in the margin, right? Those, if we support those three things, right, the same way with the bringing those two people over, help us win a championship, we can lead people out of the margins. So that's why, why I'm running is to carve a path with other groups, with my union, with other community groups that I've worked with, a carve a path for people trapped in the margins, carve a path for them out. Awesome. I mean, I know that, first of all, I love the fact that you're a public school teacher, um, very like passionate about education. I remember going into Boston public schools when I was doing observations at that time. And I remember there was one school I went into in particular, I'm not going to say the name on here, but they didn't have books. And then I would go just 15 minutes down the road and I would go to Newton and not only did they have books, but they had everything. They had fancy computers. They had like everything, just 15 minutes outside of Boston. I think a lot of times people assume that because Massachusetts is number one in public education, 
They think that we don't have inequities in, in public education, which is not true. As a school teacher, what are some of the issues that you see when you think about like lack of resources? So you went to Newton. I, if you and me want to get in the car ride one day, I love those on your, uh, on your vlog. When you go on the car rides, I'll take you right in Boston. We'll go from one school loaded with resources and we'll drive to another one with the absent within, I'll talk about four or five minute car ride. So you don't have to even leave Boston to see that. Like the big issues there is funding and budget, right? We all know that the success of a student is correlated to the investment in it. That's in anything, right? The investment in something correlates to its success. We could take that and apply that everywhere in life. But when it comes to Boston, right? First of all, I've worked at schools my whole life and I don't understand or know the budget, right? Like a uh, majority of my adult life, I've been a teacher and I don't know the budget, even at the current school I work at. And if you even try to get someone to break it down, no one can. It's convoluted and, and obtruse on purpose, mm -hmm. right? Um, so open budgeting that everyone understands and is, is involved in, right? That's one thing that needs to change. An elected school board. It, how can we function without a school board that is beholden to the people, right? We need a people-powered school board, one that is chosen and elected by the people, right? And then budget overall. I have a two steps to this. One, I want to work with my union and human rights groups to advocate for the budget before it's written. Too many times do we advocate after. We want to advocate beforehand. And then secondly, we need to change where the budget is a participatory process. Everyone in Boston gets to decide the budget, especially for schools. Every community should be involved in that, right? How can we be giving away our tax dollars, um, supporting the city with our labor and our tax revenue, and then not being able to decide how that's used? That doesn't seem fair to me. And especially we see the disparity in schools, parks, and everything when it comes to a neighborhood, right? So those are, I think, budgeting, openness of the budget, Understanding that is the biggest and most urgent issue to take care of right now. Agreed. Um, now I know that you're big on affordable housing. I think both of us have sat back the past couple of years and we've heard like politicians come in and say, we're gonna create more affordable housing in Boston, but I haven't really seen that happen the way that they said that it would. I know you're in Dorchester. Thinking back on things, how would you say that Dorchester has changed in reference to housing? Where well, I think I, I talk about um, to get biblical on you, um, you know, the, the you know Jesus said, "Where your heart lies, your treasure lies also." Right, and I feel like right now we have a city where our heart lies in development and profit. Um, what if we changed our heart and our treasures to match the people? right? Then we wouldn't mind investing. I love, people love to say reallocation, but what about allocation, right? Actual allocation of funds to keep people here and not displace them. Have we thought about tenant opportunity to buy, right? If someone wants to sell their building, the people that have been there, sometimes in Boston, 10, 15, 20 years, shouldn't they have opportunity to keep that community together? together, sorry, shouldn't they have an opportunity to purchase that that building, that apartment, and keep that community uh, running and funding, right? And also securing their housing, their legacy, and their family's legacy, right? In a city where we know from the study that the average person of color, $8 in, in, um, in um, uh, overall wealth, right? Um, how could we change that through, you know, tenancy opportunity to buy, through actual lotteries where, where people who have historically, we've all admitted it, is systemic racism, redlining is, a, is true. We've seen all the studies, read all the books. How are, we gonna, how are we going to help people overcome that, right? And I feel like that's by per opportunity purchase to, uh, opportunity for tenants to purchase their property, but also for affordable, like lotteries, for affordable housing, right? Not just for rent, but also for purchase, right? Where families of color can actually purchase and enter the housing market and secure housing. No, I, I agree. I've seen a lot of people come and go over the past couple of years, and a big part of it was the cost of living. They're just like, yeah. I can't afford to live here anymore. Even people that have like professional jobs, they just can't afford. There's no, I was trying to explain this to uh, people who don't live here. We don't have rent stability in Boston, so it's no. like the landlords can continue to increase the rent. I mean, we have no control over that. And I just see people getting pushed further and further out. Right. I mean, there's teachers in my union that I talk to, teachers. Like, I can't afford to live in Boston. Where am I going to live? I'm going to have to move out and commute and do this, and live in other states close by. 
um, we really need to look at what does it mean to build a building not for profit, but to build it to build community, uh, to give workers and union members jobs, right? And to also help families st stabilize themselves and build wealth. It helps the city overall, first of all, because we want families to stay here, mm -hmm. not just the super rich and the have nots and people struggling in between, right? We, we, we want actual families and groups to invest and stay here. And how do we do that? If we change our heart, if we change the way we think about how we develop and how we build houses, right? Then I think we would be able to do those things and provide that for those families and people. Agreed. Now, I know that you're passionate about local businesses. This is a big one for me too. Since COVID has happened, how have local businesses changed in your community? I mean, I feel like it's a twofold, right? Um, where you see businesses closing down, you see business struggling, and that's shameful, hurtful, right? But you also see in where suddenly, when the tax revenue of these business, businesses started going down, Boston started investing, doing things they said they could never do, closing down streets, taking up parking spots for outside patios, giving grants mm -hmm. and opportunities for people to, that have never had outside seating to have outside seating, right? We need these things to continue. Because we now know, think about think about if these things were going on pre-COVID times, right? Think about how much how businesses would have grown in pre-COVID times if we were investing in them the way we are now, right? We shouldn't have to invest in them um, in times of desperation. Well, let's keep these kind of practices going, right? Now that we know Boston can do it, I want to be there in City Hall to make sure they keep on doing it, to make sure they keep on supporting these businesses, right? not just when their tax revenue comes down, right? Because we have to admit all the housing things we were talking about, downtown, the waterfront, those were built off the tax dollar and the labor of the people in Dorchester, in Roxbury and in Mattapan, right? They can't get the support for their small businesses that other neighborhoods can. So we have to admit those things. So once we admit that, and once we start changing our view on that, we'll start to see the investment that we need. Agreed. Now I know that for me, when I first came to Boston, this is, oh almost like nine years, actually almost 10 years ago. Good mm -hmm. grief. Uh, when I first came, came here in reference to like local businesses, one of the things that stood out to me was that I didn't see many African-American businesses. And that was so weird to me. Like I'm walking around the city. I'm like, no, like where are all like the black restaurants, right. <laughs> like right. lounges. Yeah. And I've lived in places like DC area and, um, you know, Atlanta, like stuff like that, places like that, where I was used to seeing that. And then I came to Boston and I was like, no, seriously, like where are all the, like the black, like, like businesses? Why, why do you think that is? I mean, once again, it's investment, right? The, the we got to say it's correlated, right? The, the success of something is about its investment, right? Certain neighborhoods are consistently invested in, consistently um, have the support, from the streets to the sidewalks to the liquor licenses to succeed, right? If we remember when Ayana was on the school board, that was a big thing she was championing is opening up the liquor license so the, so the lounges can survive, right? So the lounges can be built. So the restaurants can have a nightlife and, and attract and provide um, those kind of opportunities for businesses, for people that look like us, right? If you invest in our small businesses, I'm, I'm going to pivot back to my big three. If you invest in housing to keep us here stable, and if you also invest in our education and school, our communities will flourish, just like every other community, right? Um, no community has been pulled up by their bootstraps. They've been invested in, and we have to admit that, and we deserve that. That's why I just really dislike that term reallocation, because we're always pitting our communities against other people instead of actually just saying, oh, no, maybe we should just allocate it, right? Maybe we should just give it and then these other things won't come won't come because it won't be money to support other activities that that actually harm our neighborhoods right will actually be flourishing already yeah what's your opinion on gentrification i know this is a big issue and not just boston but i've seen it in cambridge and somerville yeah and that's where i feel like this is i'm gonna go back to basketball <laughs> right we bought it we brought in um kevin garnett and we brought in Ray Allen, right, to win, right, to overcome the, the, the other teams, and the adversity that was in the way of us winning a championship, right, to build a system that worked, right? And if we focus on my big three, I feel like in the urgency, we can battle the, uh, the L.A., which we can call gentrification, right? We can beat Kobe and, and all those players, right? Because our, if our small businesses are invested in, right, or if, if people that look like me and you 
have secured housing, right? We can't get priced out. A landlord can't price us out. A landlord can't go co-op on us, right? If we have worker-owned businesses, co-ops, the city, there's, there are cooks and chefs out of business right now, right? But we also need industrial kitchens for the restaurants, right? And also for the food trucks and other um, people of color businesses. If the city was putting aside funds to help co-ops get um, started in vacant lots, we have a lot of vacant buildings that could be used for this, right? That, that would increase tax dollar, increase investment, increase wages for workers, right? Stability, right? They can even unionize and get benefits, right? There's a lot of ways that, that Boston could be investing in the individual and in people to help them stay here. Right. And I feel like how you battle that, because right, they always want to pit it. Oh, maybe we reallocate from here or we stop development here. No. What if you allocate so the people that you didn't allow to have housing had housing? What if you allocate the money so people uh, businesses that you didn't support can now th thrive instead of just barely make it and survive? Right. Or be bought out by someone who's moved in the neighborhood. Right. Because we've all seen where these multinational businesses, they don't need the neighborhood to do well to do well. You've seen Family Dollar and McDonald's survive in um, in pure poverty, right? Abject poverty, right? They don't need it. But we know when there's small businesses from people in the community that look like the community and are a part of it, communities are more successful, right? So I'm, I'm sorry, I had to go back to my basketball analogy. If we invest, <laughs> bring the big three together, there's nothing that could stop us as a community. We can really thrive. Agreed. Um, what is your opinion about public transportation in the Boston area? Because I know this has been a big one for a lot of people where they choose to live kind of depends on like if there's going to be like a subway stop or something near them so that they can get to work. And then they have to deal with the fact that the T is not 24 hours. So I, I try to explain this to people too, who don't live here. I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, you don't understand. You can't get on the train at two o'clock in the morning. It's just not running. How do you feel about like uh, public transit? So this is like, this is always, I call it my Rondo where the distributing factory, like you got to, for the big three to work, there's a lot of rondos that need to, to come into play, right? So when I think about public transportation, one, from an environmental standpoint, we are called a city by the sea, right? And I can't breathe underwater and I don't think you can either. So we need, <laughs> public transportation is not just for economic and travel, but it's also for our survival in a way, right? If we don't up our public transportation, if we, do, if we don't stop catering to cars, right? We're, we're not going to survive. So we can, we don't even, let's not, um, you, you're just not going to live in Boston in general because it's going to be underwater. So don't worry about it. And, um, and then two, it's an economic factor to open up more job opportunities to working class and lower income families and people, right? I see, I see, that's why I see it as my rondo, it's distributing, right? Transportation should, if you're focusing on the person and on the individual and on the neighborhood, transportation, public transportation is a no brainer. Right? You don't mind that investment. But right now, it's always about saving money. It's about investing in certain neighborhoods that this might not be required. In, right? We also have to think about what does it look like to have more biking in the city? More, more of that, right? A biking city. Like you said, you lived other places. I don't know, in D.C. and Maryland, I know a lot of kids who bike, mm -hmm. right, in those areas to school, right? That doesn't even really happen here in Boston. It's not set up. Kids don't go to school in their neighborhood, right? I really feel like not just the big three, but focusing on people, focusing on the community and building that would change our mind. It'd be for us to have to fight to get more T service is ridiculous. For us to have to fight to get a later T service when you know there are workers who work nights, who work at 11, who do these things, how does that make sense? Right? Where are we save? why are we saving this money, right? What, what are, why isn't it being reinvested back into the community? So that's my big feel on transportation. It's a necessary. It's my Rondo. Distributed. <laughs> awesome. I love the basketball analogy. All right, Joe, I have one more question for you. Where can people get involved with your campaign? Man, I love that question. Thank you. Because now no one will be mad at me that I don't self-promote, right, on my campaign team. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, man, if you want to find out and you want to support, please go to more4d4.com. M-O-R-E. F O R the letter D the number four dot com. Please go to more for D four dot com. Sign up for the mailing list. Um, sign up to be a volunteer. Read more about my platform. Follow me because I, I I also need everyone's help. Everyone who's listening here, I need your help. I need your support. 
because the people that are winning right now, the people that are working for it, it's working at the cost of the masses, right? Uh, and if we don't change that, if we don't work together and make this a system that works and brings people out of the margin, the problems are only get, gonna get worse. COVID has exposed and ripped off the Band-Aid of what was going on for so long. And we, we cannot go back to the way we were. That's one of the main reasons I'm running. The big three, the heart of the campaign is because these issues cannot stay the same anymore. All right, everyone, I'll be sure to put Joel's link to his campaign in the description below. Joel, thanks so much for coming. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity.